Um, so in terms of sensitive periods, for gross motor skills, which are the ones we typically are doing in sport and recreation, uh, there seems to be um, a sensitivity period up to about four years of age. For fine motor skills, it goes on much, much longer, probably to about nine or ten years of age. For vision, we know that there's a sensitive period for vision, perhaps even a critical period. Kids get born with cataracts. If the cataract is removed and a lens is placed in the eye early, those kids grow up with normal adult vision. If the surgery is delayed, beyond around two and a half to three years and then you do the surgery even though from a, an optical point of view it's identical they never learn to see well. We've gone past a critical period for vision. For math logic if you don't get the concept of add, subtract, put this to this and it makes more, take this away and it makes less, you're going to have serious math problem for the rest of your life. Vocabulary. Um, if you want a fabulous read, uh, there is a new book out, about a year old, called Proust and the Squid. Uh, Proust because he was a beautiful user of language, and the squid because squid have honking great nerve cells that you can stick electrodes in and see exactly what's going on. And it's about reading from a language and a neuroscience point of view. Proust and the Squid. Here's the difference. I suspect that you come from families and if you have families you are real keen on reading to your kids and you make sure there are books around. When you take a five-year-old from that kind of family and you compare it to a five-year-old who has come from a family where they don't have books, by the age of five the kid who has been in that enriched environment will have heard 35 million more words. Not different words, we don't have quite that many, but they would have had words spoken to them 35 million more times. And I'm going to come back to why that's so critically important a little later. Music, I obviously missed this critical period. <laughs> Second language, we all know that learning a second language is very easy. You can tell almost perfectly how old somebody was when they came to this country. If they have their original accent, they arrived in Canada after the age of about 16. If they have a perfectly Canadian accent, they arrived during the earlier years, pre-16, where there was still enough plasticity in the brain to learn the new accents. It's kind of interesting. Uh, next time you hear somebody with an accent, ask them how old they were when they got here. Just test it out. I've been testing this out on cab drivers for the last three months. Okay. Value of movement. <laughs> Why is it important to move? Um, anybody here like cats? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> no cats were harmed in these experiments. You build a carousel. On one end you have a cat who gets to walk. And on the other end you have a cat that's just sitting in a sling. So when the cat that walks walks, the other cat goes with it. You then teach them things. Those who did the walking learn more than those who saw exactly the same things but were just carried around. Movement improves learning. But we probably need to look at how the brain actually controls movement. Um, and what's really interesting is that um, cell, brain cells vote. They're very democratic. And so, um, to give you kind of a rough picture, were I to be a uh, disco dancer who wanted my arm to go up in this kind of a direction, I actually have a lot of nerve cells that control a lot of muscles and they all kind of go, I think that's roughly where this arm needs to be. And they all send signals and then those signals get combined and then it's the outcome of combining all those votes that actually directs the arm. Now, nothing new in that. What seems to be a sort of newer information is that we get very good at doing that when the body is in one orientation. 
But when we start getting into other orientations, uh, the voting goes astray. They, that some nerves think it ought to be down here, others think it ought to be up here, and so our skill breaks down quite dramatically. So we actually need to be teaching the cells to vote properly in lots of different body orientations. And this is something I will come back to when we talk about the kinds of activities that kids should be involved in. Um, we're learning a huge amount now from what are called functional MRIs. And MRIs are magnetic resonance imaging and it's a massive machine and you can put people through these machines and you can see which parts of the brain are active and what's happening. Uh, but what we've learned from these kinds of studies of learning um, is that there's a sequence. Is there anybody here who plays a guitar, however badly? Excellent man. How many chords do you know? 20. 20, okay. And when you learned that very first chord, how did you have to do it? I mean, what was the process? Yeah, and what, what did you do? You kind of thought about where this finger was going to go, where this finger was going to go, and where this finger was going to go. And to do that, if we had stuck you in a functional NMR, we would have seen large amounts of your brain trying to control those fingers. As you got better and better at it, you didn't have to think as much about it. Until all of a sudden, you've got a very few cells very accurately directing those fingers. And what that has done is cells that fire together wire together. So now you do the whole thing in one go, but you've also freed up all of that other brain power to do other things. Those neurons that were all acting when you started to learn it now can be used for other things. And that's kind of neuroplasticity, how the brain changes. So many neurons are used while we learn a skill. Then when we get good, a very few specific neurons are involved. And those that are no longer involved can get recruited for other kinds of activities, which makes it a very efficient learning system. Um, <coughs> okay, this is a very important slide. I want to know what it means. What does it mean? Who'd like to give me a meaning? Okay, what meaning? She saw a Volkswagen car. She saw a Volkswagen. Who else interpreted it that way? Yeah. <laughs> Not many. Okay. <laughs> so is there another meaning of this uh, sentence? Yeah. She put spots on a paint he had a button. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. What else could it mean? She found a software error. She found a software error. Yeah. And if she was James Bond's companion? <laughs> She might have spotted a listening device. Why am I in the least bit concerned about this bug? Because of what we know about the way the brain works. When you see an ambiguous sentence like that, what you do is you run through every possible meaning that you could have for that sentence and depending on the context that you find yourself in, your brain selects the meaning that is most appropriate. Remember what we said about kids from rich literary families versus poor literary families? Those who come from the rich literary, literary traditions will have heard 35 million more words and they will have lots more potential meanings of sentences to choose from. We know that readers from very uh, deprived backgrounds, when they see a sentence like that, they have far fewer um, alternate meanings to select from. 
The same, we think, is true in physical skill learning. In those early days, if you have lots and lots of different experiences to choose from, you've experienced lots of different things, when you're in a movement situation, you run through very rapidly all of the possible movement responses and choose the one that is most appropriate. In language, you choose the most appropriate meaning of ambiguous sentences. In physical activity, you select the most appropriate movement response to a situation where there are multiple responses possible. So that we think there is a real parallel between what happens in literacy and in physical literacy, which is one of the reasons that we selected the term. We need to build a repertoire of different types of movement skills.